All right, Grace Bible, good morning. We're in uh, the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. This is our, uh, our fifth class, CT class, which uh, I do want to share with you, adults, that uh, CT is cross-training. We go a little bit more deeper, a little more, more intimacy, a little bit more reality here, okay? It's like uh, cross-fit, okay? Uh, cross training and cross fit are the same. It's intense, okay? So what I'm saying is you might not want your little one in there listening to this, okay? Because we have some, some uh, very uh, past, strong passages that Paul was talking and using words today. And so we want to get right into it, though. We have uh, so awesome, awesome chapter, okay, of what God has provided, you know, before in CT, the first three chapters again remain, you know, it says in chapter five here, it says, therefore, therefore being those first three chapters, okay, why is it therefore the first three chapters? He's bringing into our memory those first three chapters, especially chapter one, selection of the father. I mean, Scott talked about this, sacrifice of the son, sealed by the spirit, you know, we've been seated in heavenly places to work from our position, okay, on our condition, to work from our position, seated in the heavens. We are the work of the Trinity, the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We are, we are his workmanship, his work of art, his masterpiece. So he says here, therefore, since we have this wealth, this wealth, this position in Christ Jesus, work from there. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Imitators, followers, mean to, it means to follow behind the Father. Follow behind. I know it means, to, it means to take on resemblance of. You have been remade, remade to resemble. Remade to resemble your Creator, your Father. You know, it's, uh, <clears throat> I was looking at the Mother's Day uh, video, and I saw my son, and I was like, wow, he doesn't have any hair. I mean, the blessing is, Logan, if you listen to this, you don't have this nose that I have, okay? You'll, you have a smile like your mother, and so uh, that's much more pleasing in a way there, so, so take, take heart, okay? But... As far as the hair, hey, sorry, I apologize for that. But this is, but this is, I mean, God is communicating to us that He has placed us, He's put us in this wealthy position to mimic Him. It says to be imitators, to mimic, to copy. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that's that's powerful. That's powerful, and this is what he wants to communicate to here. Now, this word, this particular word, now, imitator, the word imitator is mentioned many times, even in this book or in other books, Hebrews. But it says, but this particular word is only here in the New Testament, only here in the Bible. And he wants to communicate to us that this is special, that you are special. You are a beloved child of God. Uh, again, the Ephesians, this is 10 years 10 years in the making, 10 years of growing, 10 years of maturing. And Paul has wrote this letter to them after 10 years of walking by faith. And he says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Follow behind. Mimic the Father. I mean, I know, I mean, you guys know that my dad passed away in October. And people always say, as I aged, as I aged, man, you look more like your dad every day. And that was a, that's a, okay, that's a tremendous compliment in ways. Okay, me and him had that special feature as I already talked about. But, that's a, but it actually became cool to me because I looked just like my dad. And this is a, and he, and he says, uh, as beloved children, he says, walk. Okay, this again is, this is a present imperative, a command. Okay, a lot of people, we have a misunderstanding about commands. We're not under the Ten Commandments. We're not under those laws you know, in the Old Testament, so therefore there's, no, uh, there's plenty of commands, okay, in the Bible. There's plenty, plenty of commands in the New Testament, the New Covenant, who has enabled us to what God has commanded or commands or ask of us, He's provided for us through this wealth of a position that we have in Christ. 
He says, walk in love. Spend your life for another. It's the spending of your life for another. It's the sacrifice. He says, walk in love. And we're going to see this. Okay, we're going to see this in the scriptures today. In chapter 5 is a sort of litmus test. You know, litmus test is a test to establish the acidity or alkalinity of a mixture. But this is a test, a critical indication of future success or failure. It's a litmus test to walk in love. Are we walking in love? Okay. Are we walking in the light? Are we walking in wisdom? And this is what this litmus test is for. The litmus test is not to decide whether you're saved or unsaved. This is not what this passage is about. It's written to his church. It's written to his beloved ones, to his children who desire, had that deep desire inside us to follow behind the footsteps of our Father. So he says, walk in love just as Christ loved you and gave himself, okay, and gave himself up for us. This is in uh, verse 2, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So he gave himself to us. Now, he gave himself to us on the cross of Calvary. But I'm hoping that you're still, I mean, that still speaks to my heart. But he has given himself to us, meaning that we'll talk here in a few minutes about being filled with the Spirit. The Spirit is going to test the, to, to the Son. Just like Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Holy Spirit says, if you've experienced me, you've manifested the Son. You've manifested the Son. He elevates the Son, Jesus Christ. He says he gave himself up for us. He left heaven for us. He left his glory to bring his glory here and to give us an opportunity to glorify him. An offering, a, a free will offering, volunteer, voluntary service about the Father's business. I mean, I love this thing about the, you know, the, the passage of, you know, he says he came, Jesus came to do the will of the Father. That was his total focus. And he said, and, you know, he, he told his mother, okay, he told his mother, whom loved him very much, and he loved his mother, he said, Mom, i got to be about the Father's business. Are you taking back that I'm about the Father's business? And he wasn't talking about Joseph, he was talking about his heavenly Father. He says an offering that, uh, voluntary service to the Father, a sacrifice acceptable to God, acceptable, pleasing as a fragrant aroma, an act of worship, as an act of worship. So we see a self-sacrificing love. In 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about a love that is not emotion-centered, but others-centered. We talk about in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3, 3 through 8, not self-focused love, but other-focused Okay, so he's, he's told us here to walk in love. He's encouraged us to walk in love. Now he's going. Now Paul goes to a past, goes to uh, several things here about do not, do not, and he's going to talk about walking in lust, which is total contrary to walking in love. Now that walking in love is a, the word agape. This is it finds its source in God alone. Okay, this is not something we muster up. This is not something we produce. It is something I own, though. It is something that you own. The Spirit of God lives in you to manifest the life of Christ, agape. It is agape love. Okay? Only God agapes or agapes another as I allow him to live his life in and through me. He says, but do not. Okay, do not. Meaning what? If he's cautioning me to do not, that means I have a tendency to lean this way. Or I can, or you and I can go this way. He says, but do not let immorality, the word is pornea, where we get pornography, okay, or any impurity or unclean thought. It means unclean thought. Remember we talked about, okay, you sow a thought, you reap an action, okay? You sow an action, you reap a habit, okay? You sow a habit, you reap a character. And, we, you know, we talked about that in the Old Testament. And you sow a character, you reap a destiny, Okay, so any impure thought or greed. Now, this is not greed for money, okay? This is greed for sensuality. This is greed. It's, it, he uses, uh, he uses uh, he's got two little, two uh, 
things he's talking about here. He talks about the tongue later, but he's talking about sensuality here. And it's all linked together. He says, name, he says, these things should not even be named among you. There should not be a hint of it since you have this wealth in Christ Jesus. Since you have this position, since you're seated in the heavens, I have seated you to be able to walk. I have seated you to be able to walk. Okay, and from that position is where I elevate my condition. Now, I elevate my condition by the walk, okay, the walk. It's not something I produce. It says, it should not, there should not be a hint of it named among you as is proper among his holy ones, his children, those who have believed the gospel, those who have trusted Jesus Christ, that he died for the penalty of my sin. He took my sin debt away for God so loved me that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever would just simply believe the one time, the one time faith, the one time faith in the work of Jesus Christ would have at that moment eternal life, everlasting life upon the one time faith. But now he wants you to walk by faith many times during our life here on earth to exercise our faith in God, in the Holy Spirit, in what Jesus can accomplish in and through us. Holy one separate. He's separate. He's elevated. Again, that wealth, that wealth to be able to walk with him. And he says, And there must be no filthiness or silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. You know, and you know James talks about the tongue, how it's an unruly evil. And who can tame the tongue? Can man tame his tongue? Man cannot tame his tongue. We know that. I know that. Okay, for myself. It's an unruly evil, but Jesus can tame the tongue, okay? Jesus, he, he modeled that. He modeled that while he was on earth, and he tames the tongue. And he says that these, this filthy talk or silly talk or coarse jesting, this is about sensual things. This is about, you know, boys will be boys, right? And they talk about these things away from ladies or away from their wife or whatever. He says, guys, this should not be. This should not be found among you. There should not be a hint of this, Okay? Because what's in thought, what's in thought comes out in action through this thing called the tongue. Okay? So he goes on to say, and he, this is a stern warning. He says, for this you know, in, in verse 5, for this you know with certainty. This is the word gnosko. He says, for you know with certainty. And then he adds emphasis to it again. Even though the word says you experienced this, but do you know this for sure? You know this, okay, for certainty that no immoral, or impure, he's, he's, he's naming the things he already named. No immoral, no pornography, nothing impure in thought, or covetous man who is an idolater, who is not like we talked about that sweet smelling fragrant or aroma to God, the sacrifice of God. You know, we talked about it in the Old Testament just a few weeks ago, how Jesus had a, the angel, the, the angel of God, you know, it was a sweet-smelling savor to God, an act of worship. And he says, who is an idolater, know that this is an act of worship. And I want to read to you, I want to read to you a little note I jotted down for myself. This is somebody, somebody else came up with this, it wasn't me. He says, the real issue in worship is not if we will worship or how we will worship or, or where we will worship, but whom we will worship. For we all worship. We all worship. The thing about it is, is it idolatry? We know idolatry, what it is. In the root of it, at the base of it, it is self-worship. And who are we worshiping? Who are we worshiping? He says, who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ, of God. Does it mean that we're not going to the kingdom? You don't have an inheritance there. You know, if... Uh, uh, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12 says this. Well, verse 11 says this. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope, the full assurance of a confident expectation until the end, until the end of this life, to the end of our walk, to the end of our journey with Jesus here. He says that you may not be sluggish, that you not be sluggish, but be imitators of those who through faith through faith, remember value, the faith of value? It's in its object, in Jesus, and patience inherit the promises. That's plural. It doesn't inherit 
the promise of eternal life, that's through believing what Christ did for us way back, way back in the beginning. At age 14, I believe that. But today, I'm to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. It says in Hebrews 13, it says, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, considering the result of their conduct. Consider the result of their conduct. Imitate, imitate, mimic their faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, and Paul said this, and Paul said this many different ways. Okay, now the writer of Hebrews, that's not Paul, don't know that. But Paul even said himself, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. Okay, mimic, mimic. So it says in verse 6, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God, okay, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. They will face the wrath of God. I will not face the wrath of God. You as a believer, as a child of God, will never ever face His wrath. No, you won't. You will not face His wrath. His son paid. His son paid for you for that wrath. He took on the wrath of God that I would not have to take it on. And out of appreciation, even out of just appreciation of what he accomplished there at the cross of Calvary, how long-stretching this is, how eternal this is, how it affects my everyday life and my everyday decisions and choices in walking with him. No wrath. Walk. Walk. Walk with him. Because why? Because there is, I will not face wrath for my sin. I will not. His son paid that eternal price. Walk. He says, therefore, do not be, okay, tells me again, do not, meaning, okay, there's a chance that I, this can happen. Therefore, as a child, as all the wealth that I have, as positioned in him, this still can happen. Therefore, stop, stop, do not be partakers with them. Do not be, the word means co-holder, co-holder. Do not be a co-holder with them. For you were formerly... You were formerly darkness. Now he talks about he went from walking in love, okay, not walking in lust. Now he's going to walk in light, you know, not walk in darkness, okay? So now he, he brings up the subject of light. He says, therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light. You were formerly darkness, okay? Didn't say darkness. Come, you were dark, okay? You are light. I am light. Don't, you know, the, the, the kitty song, don't, don't hide it under a bushel. No. Let the light, let the light of God shine forth through you. He says, you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of, of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Okay. This word light means photo. Okay. I'm looking at my phone here and I'm going to my photo gallery. Okay, all right. Oh, that's a, that's a good one there. That's when I was in San Francisco with, uh, with Haley. That's a cool thing. Okay, that's awesome. Okay, there's my dad. There's my dad. That was about a year ago. That's light. He says it's a photo gallery. If God had a cell phone, he'd have your picture in it. Okay, and he's showing angels. There's Tyson. There's my dad again. You know. There's Ash. Okay, I'm just looking at this. There's my mother going down to uh, paint her cabinets this week. But anyway, it's the photo gallery. Here's a photo. Here's a photo I sent to Haley of when I baptized her. When I baptized her, of what it means to me and to her. There's, there's Maya. There's the kids playing on the roof. Yeah, sorry, I shouldn't say all that. Okay, this is Logan. We're putting in a septic tank together. Okay, just a lot of memories, a lot of memories of light that bring light into my life. You know, Framingham's house, there's Joe. You know what, there's, there's uh, Maya. She's working, working on the house there. Just a, just a photo gallery, and this is what he's saying, photo gallery of light, a photo gallery of life, eternal life. Okay, so he's talking about that photo gallery. He says, um, he says in verse 10 of, of chapter 5, he says, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord, what is pleasing to him. Okay, this, has to do, this is a, 
a term when they used uh, to test metals, okay, is to test metals, the quality of it, what is pleasing to the Lord, what is the quality of our walk, okay? It's not talking about whether it's metal or wood. It's not distinguishing between the saved and the unsaved. It's what quality? What quality? He says, consider that. Consider that in the light, okay? He says, uh, and do not participate, again, to us. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead expose them with the light that shines, the light of Jesus that shines through us. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. In secret. He says, but all things become visible when they're exposed by the light, for everything has become visible in the light. Now listen to this in verse 14. Now you want some encouragement? Verse 14 is encouragement. Okay, watch. Jesus never gives up on us. And I'm talking about his children. Okay? He never gives up on the unsaved either. But he never gives up on us. He wants to turn us around. Turn us to, hey, walk in love, buddy. Walk in the light. And he says, awake sleeper. He says in verse 14, for this reason, therefore, he says, awake sleeper. Wake up. You know, I was telling somebody the other day, um, about a brother and dear to me, I just want to shake him. I want to wake him up. And this is what Jesus is doing. He's saying, wake up. This is what the apostle, uh, the apostle to the Ephesians, the apostle Paul, he loves him dearly. Ten years he spent with, he says, wake up, guys. Wake up for you. If you're not doing these things, okay, if you're not walking in lust, okay, I'm not talking to you. But you can go there. You can go there. I can go there. He says, wake up, sleeper. Wake up. Arise from the dead. You're spiritually asleep. Wake up. He says, arise from the dead. Arise from that immoral condition. Arise. There's opportunity to walk with me. He says, and Christ will shine on you the bright and morning star. It means the day dawn. It means the light. It means the sunrise has come up. The sun, Jesus Christ, has come up, and he is waking you up today. Today will you hear his voice. Today is the day of salvation, not from the penalty of sin, but from when sin tries to dominate you, okay? Wake up. Okay, he says, therefore, now we're going into, okay, he said, walk in love, okay? Walk in the light, and now walk in wisdom or walk by the Spirit. He says in verse 15, therefore, be careful how you walk. Be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, okay, the most of every opportunity to walk how you walk with the Lord, to walk behind Daddy, to mimic His steps. I mean, you, I mean, you have to remember your kids putting on. I mean, all my kids put on my boots or whatever. You know, they're trying to walk in my shoes. Okay, it's not to walk in His shoes, but it's to walk behind, to follow Him, to follow in His steps, because the days are evil. The days are evil, and we get off the course. We can get off the course, walk behind, keep our focus on Daddy. He says, so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And then we, we all want to know what that is. We all have that desire. What is the will of the Lord? What is the, Well, in this passage, he's going to tell you what the will of the Lord is. Okay, He's going to say, and do not get drunk with wine. For that is dissipation, that is an excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And I do have an illustration here. I know I couldn't go along without it. huh? Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. To, I'm sure I'm going to spill this, to the rim. To the rim. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit, this is a present passive imperative. Continual action, listen to this, continual action done by an outside agent. Continual action done by an outside agent, and that outside agent is the Spirit of the living God to manifest the life of Christ in and through us. And it is, believers, it is a command. It is a command. Be filled. Present passive imperative. Filled not for my glory, but for His. The practical daily life, the walk. Out of the wealth again comes the walk. He says, and do not be, he says, and do not, and do not. 
be drunk with wine. You know, wine has this, um, you know, when it talks about wine in the scripture, it talks about it in, in two different ways. It brings joy for a short period of time, okay? It brings, and it, it has the meaning of control or influence, okay? He has that same, but he wants the same effect to be upon you as, as the Spirit of God as you're allowing, this is, okay, you're allowing, this is voluntary, you're allowing the Spirit of God to fill you, to fill you. Now, the problem sometimes we have in our vessel is we have holes. You know, just like the holes he talked about up here, immorality, impurity, greed, our tongue, okay? We have holes, and, and we need to fill those holes. But as we're being filled with the Spirit, okay, no leaks, okay, no leaks. He wants to fill us to the room. This is his desire. And deep down in you and deep down in me, there is a desire to be filled and controlled by the Spirit of God by the person of God, the third person of the Trinity, manifesting the life of Jesus. He says, and you see this in many different ways. He says, here, speaking to one another in psalms and, and, and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart in the Lord, always giving thanks for all the things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, even the Father. You know, he says... <clears throat> This is a, he's using five present participles. Okay, the present imperative there in verse 518, which says be filled, he says it's followed by five present participles. Okay, the first four are present active, and the fifth is present middle. This present middle followed by a threefold domestic example. He says the example of being filled with the Spirit, well, he just, he just said what that's like, okay? And now he's going to give illustrations it's threefold, and he's going to give the family, okay? He's going to talk about husband and wife. He's going to talk about parent and children, and he's going to talk about slaves and masters or employers and employees. Now, three domestic examples, and he defines these examples that his feeling looks like, okay? Not by accident that these threefold domestic examples of submission, which is the fifth participle, which we're about to get into, which is followed by the definite or definitive uh, passage of spiritual warfare. In other words, connecting, being filled with spiritual warfare. It's not separated. He says, if you want to know what spiritual warfare is like, where it, the rubber meets the road is where he says, you know, you're going to Africa or you're going to Mexico or you're going to Bolivia or you're going to Haiti. No, it's not all about that. Before you go, these things must be in line. This is what he's cautioning us about. Husband and wife relationship must be in line. Parent and child. And then at your job is this, this reality. This is where we really live the Christian life in these three areas. And then it goes on into the spiritual warfare. So spiritual warfare is not, this, is not some big event, okay, of fighting Satan somewhere in the distance, but it's the daily nitty-gritty of the day-to-day -day relationship in these three areas of life. And he's going to share that with us here. He says... Um, he says, make, I think I told you about the, um, you know, we're singing together, singing along, praising God, being thankful, that's inner praise, and now submitting to one another, which is present middle voice, which means the, the person voluntarily participates in this action. So he says, verse 21, and be subject to one another in the fear or the reverence of Christ. Okay. Now, I do want to talk about this word uh, submission, subjection, um, and the definition of it, biblical definition. It means to arrange yourself under. Follow, following a chain of command. Understanding that this is a universal principle for us, for Christians, it does not mean, what it does not mean, or does not imply inequality, but yet it doesn't imply sameness either yet not in, inferior. It doesn't mean you're inferior, okay? Uh, examples, examples of this is, um, you know, Jesus, I mean, listen, listen to this. This is Jesus and his parents, okay, the Son of God, okay? And he went down with them, and he came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them. This is Luke, this is Luke 2, 51 and 52. 
he continued, Jesus, the Son of God and God, continued in subjection to them, and his mother treasured all these things in her heart. He arranged himself under his earthly, his human parents, and Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men, with favor in God and his parents. Okay, so it's not wrong. Okay, it's not wrong. Um, so God and parents, we see that Jesus was in subjection to or submissive to his father in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 28 says this, And when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected uh, to the one who subjected all things to him, that God may be all in all. And that should be our same goal. Okay? Okay, so he says, he says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Now he says he's going to take it up personally with the wives. Okay? Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Wives, to your own husband. That's what it says. Wives, to your own husband as fitting, as fitting to the Lord. Now what this, again, what this doesn't, there's a divine order. There's a divine order. We see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who that we know they're equal, okay? The Trinity is equal. They're equally God, but Jesus was subjected to the Father. The Holy Spirit, the same, okay? Okay, there's a creation order. Man was, man, Adam was created first, okay? There's a creation order. There's a role. There's a role to play. This role, uh, I mean, you find your deepest satisfaction in fulfilling your role, Subjection to Christ first, or subjection to God, and now to your role. Creation order, and there's a glory order. You know, it talks about in the scriptures that man is the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man, okay? It, man is the spiritual leader, okay? is the spiritual leader. He's not a dictator. He's not the final authority. It says, as to the Lord. He is, as to Jesus, as to your God, ladies, is the ultimate authority. Christ has priority the husband is voluntarily. That's what the word means. It voluntary. I offer this voluntarily. It's not, it's not an imperative in, in the sense that when he will talk to husbands, when he talks about loving your wife, this is an imperative. Okay, so he says, Why subject yourselves to your husband as fitting to the Lord? Meaning there's, there's situations. If he gives you something, if your husband would try to get you to sin, maybe in these ways that you talked about earlier, you're not to do that, okay? You're not to submit to evil, okay? You're submitting to God, but, you're, but you do it respectfully, okay? You can do this respectfully, and there's many ways to do that. I can't get into all the details of that in this one sitting. Okay, so it says, for the husband is the head of the wife. That's his, that's his role he's been given, as, as Christ is the head of the church, and he's going to talk about how Christ treats the church and how the, woman, how the man should treat his wife. Okay, he says, he himself being the savior of the body, he himself being the deliverer, him, he himself being the protector and the provider. Okay, he says, subject yourself. But as, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything or every area of life. Does it mean, okay, does not mean to bow down to sin. Okay, it does not mean that. It, okay, you have to go to the Lord first. He's your ultimate authority, and the husband has a role in that, but he's not your ultimate authority. Okay, God is. Now he moves on to uh, verse 25. He says, husbands, agape your wife. Husbands, agape your wife. Now, agape, the, the word for love here, is this is something that comes from God. This is not man produced. Its source is found in God and God alone. Okay, for God so loved the world, agape. Husbands, agape your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is unconditional. This is sacrificial love, okay, seeking the highest good for another. As Jesus sought the highest good for us in giving his life, this is what it says for the man. Husbands, this is a command now, this is an imperative. Okay, this is not a suggestion. Husbands, love your wives. And why is God able to command us, fellow brothers? Because he's empowered us 
the wealth that we have in Christ, he's empowered us to do this. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands, you ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Okay, that he might sanctify her, that he might wash her. Now let me, let me say this, gentlemen, husbands, okay? What Paul is saying is to be able to sanctify her first, you must walk in love. First, you must walk in the light. Now, you can't sanctify her if you're not doing this, okay? You can't sanctify her if you're not walking in the light. You can't sanctify her if you're not walking in love, okay? You can't sanctify her if you're not walking in wisdom. That God, the wisdom is, is you're being filled with the Spirit of God. Being filled to the rim, okay, is God's desire. And I want that, and I know you want that. I know that deep desire in you. God placed it there. He created this in you. He remade you to resemble. He remade you to resemble him. Okay? And this is who he is. He says that he might sanctify her. This is the washing. Now, this is, okay, you can get a little bit R-rated here, okay? Just giving you a little fair warning. Okay? This has to do with, like, uh, my wife is so going to kill me, okay, when she listens to this. It's like... We're spiritually bathing her, okay? This is what this is talking about. And I remember early in our marriage, okay, we would take a shower. We could take a shower together, okay? And I enjoyed that immensely, okay? You get that? But anyway, I enjoyed that immensely. But the thing about it is, he says, do you enjoy, I mean, buddy, how do you enjoy, do you enjoy this? Do you enjoy sanctifying her spiritually? That you will present her. I mean, watch this. Watch this now. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her. This is aortic tense. Okay, this was, means it happened in time past, but it continues to happen. And it, it continues and continues and goes on and on. It's eternal. With eternal results. I'm responsible for her holiness, for her her, saint, or her being sanctified. He says, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. With the Word of God. Washing her with the Word of God. Is this constant, guys? I don't see it and, and have Sandy sit here and, and listen to this. No, it's constant. It's as we are riding together. It's as we're at home, as we're sitting by the way. I'm teaching her the Word of God. I'm sanctifying her, being a part of washing her. That he might present to himself the church in all her glory. Now listen to this. No spot, no blemish, no wrinkle. That word means... No sign of aging. That's what that word means. No sign of aging. And I mean, you live in this world long enough. I mean, obviously, physically, there's a sign of aging. I mean, you got it right here in front of you. Okay? But there's no sign of aging. There's such joy that comes from this experience. That, that he should be holy and blameless. He says, so husbands ought also to love their own wives and their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. Never hated, you have never hated his own flesh, but nourishes, brings to maturity, feeds, cherishes, warms. She finds comfort. She finds assurance, but nourishes, cherishes, feeds them. It means to warm. Cherish means to warm, to keep warm. She finds affirmation. She finds acceptance because of her position, too. But you want the position, you want her condition too, to line up to the position of the bride, okay? In all her glory. Because we are members of his body. He says, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. One plus one equals one. I know that's bad math. But it's a spiritual principle. He says this mystery is great, but it's previously brought to the light. Okay, it's brought to the light. But I'm speaking in reverence to Christ in the church. Didn't know this. But now we know this. Okay? We know as Christ ministers to his church, that's how we're to minister to our bride. He says, nevertheless, let each individual among you, each one among you, also love his own wife as himself. Agape. Present imperative. 
And let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. Uh, a couple comments. A couple comments on that uh, as we close here. Husbands, our actions following behind, following behind Jesus, how he treats his bride. Husbands' actions must mimic Jesus. He's asked us to do that, to follow behind, to lay down his life, to lay down your rights, to lay down my rights, to lay down my selfish agenda, to lay down the life and bathe her, sanctify her. The husband sets the stage for her voluntary performance. The husband sets the stage for her to submit. And, this, and the, to the husband, it's the only imperative, command to obey. He commands us. He didn't ask us. It's not a suggestion. It's a heavy-handed command because he's provided. He's has, he has that provision. To the wife, your actions should mimic the church. Submission, submission to your lead. Submission to your protector. Submission to your provider. Submission to your deliverer. And this means spiritual deliverance of sanctification. Allow him to be responsible. Allow him to lead. Don't take the lead. Well, he's not lead. Don't take the lead. Allow him to lead. Allow him to be responsible. Arrange yourself under Jesus. Arrange yourself under Jesus, first priority. Arrange yourself under your husband. Okay, so we, we're closing with, uh, you know, again, a litmus test. Walk in love. Are you walking in love? Okay, are you walking in love? Not walking in lust, walking in love. And if you can't say with assurance that, well, I don't really, no, you know, okay, you know, you're walking in love or you're walking in lust. You're walking in light or you're walking in darkness. You're walking in wisdom or you're being foolish, okay? You're walking in the Spirit, you're being filled with the Spirit. The, the word means cram full. Cram full of the Spirit of the living God. Are you cram full? And you know, it's kind of crazy how we talk about alcohol consumption and all this kind of, I'm not talking about that, okay? Are you cram full? Of the Spirit of God. If you're not crammed full, you need, this is what you need to work on. The other can go to the wayside, okay? It means absolutely nothing, okay? Are you crammed full of the Spirit? Can we say that? Can I say that? Well, you know what? I can't say that, so I need to concentrate on this. I need to be crammed. He desires to fill me to the rim. To, no leaks. No leaks. That's his desire. That's his desire for me here. And an inheritance awaits, Okay? Lasting control, walk in wisdom, filled with the Spirit. Well, folks, I hope you enjoy today. I enjoy studying the Word of God. I enjoy meeting with God. I enjoy what He teaches me, okay, what He teaches me, what He, what he desires for me to do. And that's to, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Can I say that? Can you say that? Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this litmus test of sorts that, Father, you, you challenge us. Are we walking in love? Are we walking in the light? Are we walking in wisdom? We have such a wealth of being placed in Christ Jesus upon our one-time faith. But, Father, are we exercising? Are we living our life to the fullest here on earth? Pleasing to you, am I, or your people, a sweet savor, aroma in your nostril? Thank you. Thank you, Father, for making a provision for us. Thank you that what you have commanded, you have instilled in us, and you want it to come forth. Come forth. Arise. Arise, my child. Awake out of that sleeper, that sluggishness. Arise from the dead. Thank you for resurrection power. In Jesus' name, amen.